Good evening and a very warm welcome to this webinar, which we've devised firstly to introduce you to the next stage of the Church Life Review, including the creation of three task groups. Secondly, to outline the opportunities which now exist for people to contribute to those task groups. Thirdly, to say something about how we envisage a new nominations committee operating. And also to provide some brief updates on work that's ongoing in response to certain resolutions from last year's General Assembly. And there will be opportunities along the way to discuss and to ask questions. But please note, should you wish to comment or ask a question in the plenary sessions, you'll need to use the raise hand function in Zoom, as we're not able to see physical hands, I'm afraid. And all of this finishing by nine o'clock. Uh, my name is Adrian Bully, and I'm Deputy General Secretary for Discipleship, and my colleagues around the table are going to introduce themselves. You go first, Philip. Okay, yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Philip Brooks. I'm the Deputy General Secretary for Mission. I'm delighted to see so many of you with us. Good evening, everybody. I'm Victoria James, the Chief Operating Officer. And I'm John Bradbury, the General Secretary. Good to see you all. So, John, General Assembly feels like a rather long time ago. <laughs> What's been happening since on the Church Life Review front? Indeed, it's one of those things, isn't it, where it feels like a long while ago, and yet in another sense it feels like we've blinked and, and here we are. Um, and it's one of those moments when I've been learning yet again, I'm not sure I'll ever fully learn that, Everything in the life of the URC takes just that little bit longer than you think it might. Um, but there's been all sorts of things going on since Assembly took uh, the decisions in July. Um, so the Business Committee was giving some initial thought to how we might set this process off over the summer. But one of the things we realised pretty quickly was that we really wanted to talk this through with the, the Synod Moderators meeting. Because that meeting around the table has really an overview of the life of the URC on the ground in a way which is unparalleled and there's a lot of wisdom there so we wanted to 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 be able to take some of those conversations with us before we went too much further we also wanted to make sure that we'd got the new nominations process to some extent uh nicely underway because we needed to use elements of the new process in the appointing of the task groups to their work so there's been a lot of work then going on on role descriptions, um, remits for the task groups. We've been in the process of appointing a program manager who will offer lots of um, um, support and capacity to enable us to keep the process moving. And I'm delighted we've made a good appointment. We're not quite at the point where we can announce um, a name, but uh, that there is someone who has accepted an offer, which is great. Um, and um, it's been a kind of a busy time. So it feels like quite a long while since General Assembly, but here we are finally about to kind of launch the next bit. So a lot of this sounds really quite technical. And in some ways, many of the questions the task groups are looking at about financial resource sharing and providing resource um, support to churches and how we support congregations to employ people they feel a bit mundane. Is this process only about money and structures? <laughs> it's a really good question, that. Um, because in reality, there is quite a lot about money and structures that is technical, and indeed, for quite a number of folk, perhaps even rather dull. But one of the things we keep bumping into as a church is that our resources and structures often kind of take us away from the things that we really want to be getting on with in terms of our ministry, our mission, our evangelism. And there is a real need to try and attend to some technical matters in the hope that this frees us up. Because it's absolutely vital um, that we hold 
before us the kind of big picture of what this is all about. So the Theos report, which I hope many of you will have had a chance to look at, showed that there's huge vitality in the URC, often in really small congregations that are doing extraordinary work in their local communities, transformative work for Christ's sake. And better being able to support those churches in the work that they are doing, relieving them of some of the burdens that, that, that kind of grind people down and make it difficult for congregations to keep carrying on the work they're doing is really pretty vital. We also know, of course, that there are, sadly, lots of congregations coming to the end of their life. Their vocation in the communities they serve is concluding. But alongside that reality, we also need to hold the reality um, that there are all sorts of possibilities for the planting of new communities, for pioneer ministries, for all kinds of new pieces of work, which will, to continue using our metaphor from um, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's letters to the exiles, that will allow us to plant seeds, that will become gardens, that will resource the church of the future, and be there to offer sustenance for those who come after us. So yes, there is a lot here which is technical, it's about finance, it's about structures, it's about legal structures, um, and that isn't everybody's cup of tea, perhaps, but it really is vital to this bigger picture of being the people of God that we're called to be. So what happens next? Well, in a moment, uh, you will hear about some of the amazing opportunities that there will be for folk to get involved with the next stage of the work. So we are beginning the search for those who will form the task groups uh, to help move this piece of work on that will help us come to the stage where General Assembly is able to discern together uh, and, all being well, come to our mind and take some decisions. The Business Committee, having given us some really careful thought about how we manage this, have concluded that if we put all the business that will come out of the work of these groups into a, a General Assembly, it will become far too packed in terms of business. Those of you who were at Assembly last year will know it was difficult to feel that we were able to take space and time in the work that we were doing. So we are proposing and hoping that we will hold an extraordinary General Assembly later in 2025, in November, precisely so that we've got the time to do that discerning together once this work is done and really come to a mind as to where we are headed next. And some people will say that's, that's far too slow. The needs are pressing and urgent and this stuff kind of just needs to happen and we've got to get on with it. And I have a lot of sympathy with that because the needs are pressing and urgent around the life of the church. But at the same time, there will be others who will say, my goodness, that's really fast. And if we don't take our time on this, we won't get it right. And we can't afford to get it wrong. And they have a real point too. So we hope that we have set a timetable that will keep us moving because this does matter. and We've got to keep on with this. But given that everything does always end up taking just that little bit longer in the life of URC than perhaps we ever think it might, we hope that this is a timetable that will give us that little bit more space than if we were aiming for July 2025, because it is so vital that together Assembly discerns the will of God, the call of the Spirit, as we seek God's will for our future shape in the coming days. So to remind us of just some of the bigger picture of the hopes and dreams and aspirations Assembly has for some of the things that might well end up being fruits of the labour of some of this technical work. Philip's just going to remind us of some of the key bits of, of work that Assembly has lain before us as challenges to respond to. Thank you, John. Um... I'm sure I can't be the only person to sit at General Assembly and it, when it comes to that point of a list of churches which have closed in the previous 12 months, um, to feel slightly depressed by that number and, and, and saddened to see those 
um, communities of faith which have closed in that previous 12 months. Uh, and sometimes the, the regret seems to be such a long list. We, we did celebrate two new churches at this last General Assembly, but you, you do, after seeing the long list, think, well, where's the new life? So I was really excited, actually, that in the um, part on the church life review, there was a resolution which was about um, emerging new URC communities of discipleship and worship. Um, not only that that came to the um, to General Assembly, but actually on the floor of General Assembly, um, the Assembly engaged with it and strengthened the resolution. Um, and so they pointed it at mission and discipleship departments so that we would do some more work on that um, to look at how we might encourage and resource those new communities. Uh, and that's contained uh, in Resolution 51A there. Now, as we began the work on that, we realised that, that it actually connects well with some other resolutions at General Assembly, because, of course, if we're looking at new communities, and given that the gospel call is that we should be alongside the poor and the marginalised, then we have Resolution 31C, um, which actually asks, um, and I think we perhaps even have a slide to show that, um, Resolution 31C, which asked mission and ministries um, to consider how we can um, better get alongside those marginalised communities. There was a piece of research um, early in 2023, which showed that the established and um, traditional churches were closing much quicker in poorer communities than they were in more affluent ones. So actually, if we're talking about establishing new communities of discipleship and worship, it would seem likely that we we will be called to those very poor communities, um, and equally that those will require resources to do that. Uh, and then, of course, being an ecumenical church, um, the other resolution that we're looking at is Resolution Thirty Eight, um, which actually we developed as mission team in conjunction with Youth Assembly, um, and that's about we're ecumenical working, resource sharing and ways in which we can better steward our resources in that respect. Now, we, we spoke earlier on, or John spoke earlier on, about um, money and structures can sound a little bit dry, um, but actually the one commonality running through those three resolutions, which are very much the outward-facing um, point of the church, they all look to how can we use our resources better, how can we find resources, and of course my hope for the church life review process is that it is going to be enabling and freeing up so that we can actually really engage in an earnest way with these mission opportunities and i see very much that the task group that task groups that victoria is now going to speak to are ways in which actually this allows us to get on with this outward facing mission that is so important uh, and that gospel call to be alongside those people that god calls us to Thanks, Philip. So we've heard a lot already this evening about exciting opportunities um, that are before us as a denomination, and within that, exciting opportunities for people to come forward to serve. A big part of that is the three task groups that were um, approved at General Assembly. So we're now embarking on the process of appointing to those task groups. And essentially, they're going to be groups that work to do some modelling on different areas and a bit of research to bring recommendations and options to that later General Assembly in 2025. Because their work will interlink and be interdependent in some ways and link to some of the other resolutions that uh, Philip has just mentioned, plus some others that are, are going on in other areas of uh, the church, it will need some support. And that support will come from the programme manager um, that John mentioned earlier that we're in the process of appointing um, to help make those links and support the groups. So looking now at the particular subjects, um, you may or may not have seen online that there are some details out there about the three task groups um, covering broad areas. The first being the finance and resource sharing task group, which will essentially be looking at models through which we can share resources between synods and General Assembly. Um, so that is quite a technical group, um, looking at legal structures, et cetera. 
The second is then around support services. Now, this I'm already hearing has um, some enthusiasm to look at how we can resource locally and across synods in those key operational areas like safeguarding HR to really enable and free local churches from those administrative tasks so that they can focus on the much more mission focused activities. And the third being uh, local lay workers, how we can have structures in place and the kind of roles we might want to employ to enable some more local lay ministry. So we're looking now to appoint to these um, positions on task groups, and they're a real opportunity to make a significant difference within the denomination, shaping our shared life and how we might move forward. So for each task group at the moment, we are looking for applications and nominations for people to serve either as members or as conveners. People can apply directly, or you may wish to nominate someone's name and then they will be contacted and encouraged to make an application. The deadline for receipt of applications is the 12th of February. So if you are putting someone's name forward, please be mindful of that so they have time to discern whether they wish to apply and to meet that deadline. The terms of reference and role descriptions for both the conveners' roles and the members' roles, along with terms of reference for all those three resource um, task groups are on the website which are there to help you in deciding whether you might want to nominate someone and to help those who may wish to apply discern whether that is what they're being called to do. General Assembly um, decided that we would make all volunteer appointments within our committee structure using safer recruitment principles and processes. And that will apply in the application process um, and nomination process for the, the three task groups. So after an application, it will be followed by a two-way interview style conversation. Um, so yes, a conversation to um, help those appointing to those volunteers uh, into post discern whether they're the right fit, but also an opportunity for those who think they may wish to serve to decide whether it is something that is the right fit, an opportunity to ask more questions. And references will be taken up. Ultimately, the business committee will be looking to confirm a convener and up to 10 members for each of the task groups. General Assembly in stating that we were going to use safe recruitment principles have really set a culture shift for the denomination. And Philip alluded earlier that we're now appointing um, someone to a recruitment development officer who is going to support us in rolling out that process more fully with pro forma documentation and a detailed process to enable committees to moving forward, be able to fulfill those safer recruitment possibilities and principles. So thinking about those three task groups, we wanted to give you opportunity to um, discuss and consider them. So we're going to split us up into breakout rooms and ask you to consider three questions. They will come up on the screen in a minute and we'll make sure they're in the chat so that you can access them while you're in the breakout room. But what we're asking you to think about in terms of the three task groups, firstly, what excites you? What kind of gifts and graces do you think are needed for the different work? And who do you want to see apply or be nominated for these pieces of work? So if you have names that are already springing to mind, please do note them. We would ask that in each breakout room, you nominate someone to be ascribed to capture your thoughts and reflections to each of those three questions. We'll then put into the chat an email address that whoever the scribe um, has been volunteered, who they can um, send those responses into that email address. That would be really helpful. Thank you. And that's for about 10 minutes. Oh, Jeff. Diana Peters. He tells you now.
Excellent. I think you all made it back through cyberspace to us, which is great. Um, so this is a moment we can take any questions or comments or thoughts that have emerged from the conversations you've just been having. So um, if there's something that you'd like to say or something you'd like to ask, please use the raised hand function and um, Adrian will tell me who's got their hand raised and hopefully we'll take things from there. So is there anyone would like to ask a question, make a comment? Well, we have a, a comment in the chat about, a chat about the email address, um, which I think you should find slightly further up the, the chat. So, um, El Elspeth, thank you very much. Would you like to unmute and share with us? Um, I, th I thought one of the positives from our group that people were excited about was the importance of lay preaching and also about looking at new ways of doing things gives us hope and creating something that might last. Uh, I think that those were the things what, that made us excited. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Lay preachers are at the heart of so much of the life of the URC. Such an enormous proportion of our worship is led by lay preachers. Uh, they're, they're vital in the midst of this, and it is always good to think of new things. So, Romilly, thank you. Thank you. Um, we had um, a, a small concern that uh, there, were, there needs to be a strong coordination between particularly the finance and resource sharing group and the support uh, services group because that the, there's bound to be uh areas where they're treading on each other's toes unless somebody is um is giving them the the steps that they need to walk in so we hope thank that you. that is going to be um dealt with thank you yes absolutely that doesn't appear in the paperwork on online because that's that's doing a slightly different job but the hope is to have um a small um, I, I think we've called, termed it a programme board, which is possibly slightly excessive sounding, but a meeting of the conveners of the three um, groups with the programme manager convened by one external person, precisely with the aim of trying to keep all um, everything pulling in the right direction and in the right order, because otherwise, indeed, we will we'll run into all sorts of problems. So I hope we, we've done that. I think Victoria wants to add something. And we've tried in the terms of reference for the three task groups where it's already apparent as the link and interdependence you've just mentioned, Romilly, to put it in the terms of reference of where they're currently obvious and then the, the, the programme board will help that iteration of where the links continue to emerge. Um, so hopefully that will support that interlinking and interdependency. Thank you. And um, I think we go to uh, Vicky's iPhone, it says here. Vicky. Uh, Hi maybe... there. Hello. Can you, can you hear we me? Can, we can hear you. Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm a bit new to all of this, but just a, a couple of things I sort of, um, thought I'm going to mention. This thing about sort of new things and attracting people. The URC that I attend we get our biggest attendances for traditional Christmas fates and Christmas fairs and all of the more kind of modern activities, I don't know that's not the right phrase, that happen in the church across the road from us aren't as well attended. So I think there's still a big pull for traditional URC approach. I don't know if I'm phrasing that in the right way, but this thing about reaching out for new things I think is needed but I don't want to sort of come away too much from the traditional side of it um the other thing is engaging uh with local churches lots of people um myself included want to help out but a lot of people you know this work full-time other responsibilities so we're relying a lot on people that are perhaps retired um or work part-time and there just isn't enough free help so I'm just wondering how we're gonna if we come up with these new ideas um how are we gonna make it happen <laughs> thank you two really helpful comments there 
I, th I think the mission of a local church has always got to be contextual to the place it is. Um, and of course, um, in any one community, there are all sorts of, as it were, different layers to community life. And there is still um, a really strong attraction to certain traditional elements of church life in certain places. Um, and in other places and other communities, I suspect new ways of going about things tends to, to draw people in. We're really aware of um, the increasing shortage of volunteers and that kind of army of extraordinary, um, often newly retired people with amazing experience behind them that for many, many years have run our churches and run the denomination are not there in the same way. Um, and in a sense, part of this project, whilst we're relying on volunteers to help us get there, um, is trying to take us to a place where we might be able to use our resources um, to um, help us engage with some of those things that volunteers perhaps previously have done to leave the members of the church that we've got free to really engage in the mission of the of the church that's our hope um steve faber steve thank you thank you john we we didn't get very far with the the questions uh two things that i think are worth hearing um one is that uh the, the point that was just being made about the lack of volunteers and whatever we do in terms of uh, structure for the denomination, we've got to remember that most of our churches are struggling um, through reduced numbers and ageing profile. The other was a plea that um, the, the most encouraging um, thing that came out of the first phase of Church Life Review was the Theos report. And a little bit of uh, concern that, that the task groups might not be uh, focused on some of those conclusions from the Theos report and a plea that they should be. Thank you. Yes, I, th I think we're all profoundly aware of the first of those things. Um, and part of what we're about here, I think, is, is trying very honestly to um, engage with the reality that, um, to some extent, so many of our congregations are struggling and think about, well, how can the wider church um, support that? But it, it, it's never going to be um, it's never going to be straightforward. Um, and indeed, some of the, the the wider concerns that the Theos report flagged up um, are are really important. Um, and a lot of this process is about that sort of back office support that hopefully enables some of the the front office of mission and evangelism and witness to flourish. Um, but some of the, the, the things that the Theos report was pointing us towards in terms of our need to continually deepen and develop our discipleship so that our extraordinary witness, often through the, um, the kind of service to community element of church life, comes with a profound sense of discipleship and ability to share the gospel. And that is something we, we must not lose sight of. We continue to put discipleship at the heart of a lot of what we do. Um, and in some senses, though, um, I think as I've observed the life of the URC over many years, we can run all the national mission and discipleship programs in the world, but actually the real place where the rubber hits the road with discipleship and mission is the local church. Um, and we need as much resource as we can in the local church to enable the local church to really deepen its discipleship so that it's equipped for evangelism so there is lots the wider church can do but but the real heart of that has always got to be be the local i suspect Anne, uh thank you it's following on really from um uh, comments that other people have made uh the people who know me know that i'm generally the optimist um but i'm feeling a bit pessimistic this evening um which is very rare because if we're going to touch the churches that are struggling, then we're going to need to involve people from the smaller struggling churches within this task group setup. There are very able people in small struggling churches who are so busy supporting their small struggling churches, and I'm one of them, that I could not join one of these task groups without running, having a nervous breakdown. But we, we have learned, uh, working at Synod level and what have you, the way to know what's going on and to get involved is to get involved. 
And my concern, which came from our group actually, is how is all of this going to touch the smaller, struggling local churches who are doing excellent community work, but have small numbers of bottoms on seats in, in worship. And, and that is really what the national church sees, isn't it? The, the number of bottoms on churches. You don't see our community work. Um, you don't see what's going on. So it, I, I'm just pessimistic, really. I, I don't know how we reach, how we get the people on the task groups that we need on the task groups, because they're the people who know what it's like at, at, at grassroots level. I mean, I think one of the things the Theos work did so brilliantly was to listen really carefully to the life of congregations like that. And that gave us a really optimistic picture of um, a lot of the work our churches are doing. Uh, and in part, some of this is an attempt at a response to what we heard from congregations like that. I take your point that it's really difficult in a small congregation that's maybe reliant on possibly just one person, possibly two people, to take those people away to do a big piece of work like this would have massive consequences. And I think one of the aspects of this that's going to be so vital is the way in which the task groups themselves consult, listen, um, are out there and hearing precisely the experiences of congregations like that, so we can make sure that the results mm. are genuinely doing what is hoped and will serve those congregations rather than what is all too easy, what you think is going to serve them, which isn't always quite the same same thing. Thank you. And Alison Micklum. Thank you. I think that point you've just made is crucial because I think that you, so many of the programmes that have happened over the past haven't really hit the local churches that they were most uh, aimed at. But that wasn't the point I wanted to make. I wanted to simply ask whether anybody got onto question three because we spent so long actually developing some excitement for question one that we never got onto question three so um yeah uh, i don't know if there's any answers to that one because uh, we never got there <laughs> well there's 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 time yet for people to answer question three uh, and and i really hope that those of you who've had the opportunity to come here this evening will go away and and enthuse and encourage um and talk about this and spread the word um, so that we can, uh, we're rootle out from the corners of the URC, those folk who really do have the gifts and graces we need to do this work. So if you didn't get to question three, and it's always the way in a breakout group, isn't it? You never quite make it to the last question. Um, I hope it's very much the live question that you'll all take away from this. And I think we can take one, one final comment from uh, Alison and Paul. Thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to go back to um, what Anne was saying, and in complete agreement, um, those that know me in my synod, I'm from the East Midlands Synod, will know that I'm a great advocate for um, the local church. That is where I have I was born into and have grown up, and my children and my family are there. And the local church is incredibly important to me, but so is my synod and the national church. I would give anything to be a part of this task group, but I have not got any more hands, any more brain or any more time to give. Anne mentioned grassroots. I work in education and it's very frustrating to be told what to do by people who sit in an office around a table. And I would implore the task groups to please come and visit local churches. Don't just email and ask questions come and visit come and see what we're like on a sunday morning so that you can get a real feel for a local church in its own community where it's either thriving or struggling but at least then there'll be a really good overview of what that church is going through and maybe come to a church meeting so that those people in those congregations those local churches without whom we would not have a denomination can feed into this task for, task group and and you know answer some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really helpful observation, and I think it is often only by um, by turning up, forming relationships with people, having conversations, listening that one really does um, get to the heart of of what's making a local community tick. 
So I very much hope that we can indeed encourage uh, the, the task groups to take some time um, to do that in the, in the course of their work. Thank you. Right, I think we're going to move on and think just a little bit now about um, the excitement of the new nominations committee. And I'm going to hand over to Philip again. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And I, and I hope that some of what I'm going to say now might pick up on those exact points. Um, we, we mentioned earlier on that um, there is a new nominations process. Just to remind you of the present system, um, we draw one representative from each synod, and usually that is um, one of the synod clerks. Uh, and they have the seemingly impossible task of identifying people for the many and varied roles across the conciliar system that is the URC. And, and it is very reliant on the circle of people that those individuals know. And of course, you know, we are all limited to the number of people that we know. Um, so because of that, General Assembly 2023 was a bit of a reality check, really, that we needed to streamline what is an unwieldy process. And, and in saying that, I would like to pay tribute to Helen Lidget as convener and Margaret Marshall as secretary um, for their commitment and hard work in managing a way of working which they would be the first to say has become um, unsustainable. Now, at the same time, we realised as a denomination, and um, we, we talked about this, this earlier, that we needed to introduce safer recruitment to these volunteer roles. And that's not simply about the safeguarding side of it in terms of reference, but it's also about accessibility, opening up the volunteer recruitment base, which is why I think perhaps this might address some of the points that were made earlier, that actually what we've not done before is when we've wanted volunteers for various committees, we've not actually advertised widely across the denomination. And the hope is that actually by making these volunteer roles more um, approachable, um, that we can actually get people that we might never have thought about applying for these roles. Um, now, General Assembly laid out a new way of working for nominations in brief. So it's going to be a smaller committee, which is always easier to manage. Um, six in total. Um, a convener who will be appointed by General Assembly. Um, a member of General Secretariat, ex officio, and we've deliberately left that so that it is it could be what any one of the um, the four general secretariats so that we can cover that. Uh, and then four further members, one of whom would be um, an HR specialist member of the Resources Committee, um, one person with equality, diversity and inclusion specialism, um, a person either from Racial Justice Advocates Network or from within Global Intercultural Ministries, um, and a representative from United Reformed Church Youth. And the last two of those would also serve as nomination champions. Uh, and just to say a word about nominations champions, because uh, we've spoken about in the report about having a champion in every synod. But that's not to create a whole new extra number of roles that we need to find people for. Actually, um, that doesn't have to be a separate role. It could still be the synod clerks. It will be the people who will signpost to help ensure that adverts for volunteer roles are in synod newsletters, highlighted at synod meetings um, and referring inter interested parties to the relevant committees. There will be admin support for nominations, including um, General Assembly envisaged a, a resource and business committee agreed to um, a temporary role, a 12 months role, to help the assembly committees to get to grips with the safer recruitment, the role descriptions, the adverts, the interview processes, um, and I'm pleased to say that we did actually make an appointment today. Again, we're not in a position to give a name because there's all the relevant um, things to go through beforehand, um, but we are quite um, happy with our uh, appointment. Um, also, the new nominations committee won't be dealing with the same number of nominations because some of the roles will be delegated to assembly committees um, for the subcommittees and for representation. So, for example... Uh, the one that I'm most closely involved with, Mission Committee, then, you know, Mission Committee will deal directly with ecumenical representation. Uh, Net Zero Task Group, for example, is one that Mission Committee recruited, Interfaith Enabling Group. So those will now be um, done under the auspices of Mission Committee uh, and they will report 
about that recruitment to General Assembly and their reports. Um, now, the members of nominations committee are more prescribed in nature, um, and they, it identifies which part of the church they will come from, as I'd listed earlier. But we are seeking applications for the convener role. Uh, and of course, this is not such a, a, an important role for the church because these th this committee is the one that's going to help populate the committees that actually make our church run. Um, so that uh, convener role on the new committee starts from General Assembly 2024. Um, but Helen and Margaret very kindly have agreed to offer um, uh, 12 months um, as consultants to help with the handover process so that, that you know, we know we do make sure that we don't miss anything in the change. Um, and I think that concludes everything we need to say about nominations. We're going to send you back into breakout rooms for a, a short period now. Um, we have two questions for you, and what we will do is make sure that we put them back in the chat again uh, for the um, breakout rooms, because we've picked up that several of you said that um, you haven't seen the questions previously. So we'll we'll send them again once you're in breakout rooms. Two questions just though, to, to start your thinking processes. Um, what means of communication or networks would help us spread the word about opportunities to serve most effectively? So how, how do we encourage people to apply for them? Um, what information would most encourage people to think about serving the wider church who perhaps haven't before? Um, so we're going to put you into breakout rooms now. And uh, again, please, will you um, appoint a scribe and the same email address as before um, to let us know your brilliant ideas and wisdom that you come up with in your breakout rooms. Information would most encourage people to think about serving the wider church. Helen, thank you. I, you know, it, it seemed really appropriate to have the... Um, the current convener of nominations to ask the first question so uh, fire away. um yeah but it's not my comment it's from uh, another member of the group who suggested uh, as long with all the electronic methods that we've already talked about um that it would be very useful to go to all those people who are members of the 2023 general assembly who already have some background in this or should do if they've been paying any attention at all or can go back and read the um reports um, and use them as people who can contact others whom they may know. Um, and a related question was, give them a free lunch before you start asking them to join a task. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent point. Thank you, Helen. And, and we'll go to another Helen, Helen Everard. The point was made in our group that um, it's, it's a lot to put on when trying to incentivize people to join things that the um the presentation is is really hard so if we're going to send things out to people um then some of the things that we've been asking people to do with all of the um the the, the information that's already been there about these people in task groups seem very kind of dry and dull and it might need to be repackaged in a very snazzy way one of our groups suggested something that she called a sexy front um, to incent to, to to kind of put it out there and say, "Wow, this is new opportunity," um, and then afterwards can come all of the things. But but just to be able to, but but that local local synod clerks possibly champions might not have the time or resources to do that. So it might be something that perhaps comms could take on, perhaps Andy could do, this is me, um, uh, you know, free pair of socks with every with, with, with every role description, um, just to make it look kind of um, fun and appealing to then get the message out there. So our head of com communications is taking down that the URC needs a sexy front, so we'll, <laughs> we'll work on that one. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do say the point, and it's very valid that actually people can be put off by a lots and lots of words, and, and um, I, I, I hope that the new resource that's going to help us with this transition, and um, who actually I believe is somebody who really understands how to make things um, approachable, uh, will also help in this process. But the point is well made. Thank you. 
Uh, Sue, Sue Fender. Good evening. Um, I think one of the concerns from our group was this uh, deadline of the 12th of February. We're talking about how we might engage with people and encourage them, but in a fortnight, we think that's fairly impossible. Yeah, th th there is the, the dilemma, isn't there? Because on the one hand, we've got the pressures that, you know, we we really want to, to get on with the church life review and those that say, oh, it's happening too slowly. But on the other side, these things do take time. Um, so obviously we will know by the 12th of February what the response is and, and obviously uh, adapt from there as necessary. Thank you. Oh, if, Victoria, yeah. A note of encouragement. I think the information had been online um, for about two hours when I got the first notification that one nomination had been received. Um, so I thought that was rather exciting. So there is response starting. Um, so it's not kind of from scratch from tonight. There has been interest since it went up online, but I still take the point it is a tight time frame. And that was one of the reasons for holding this webinar this evening. We thought, let's do something a little bit different. And if I'm honest, we, we didn't expect to see so many of you. So actually that was... It's quite encouraging to, to see the buy-in already. Um, so we're going to go to Scotland now, to John Collins. When it, comes to, sorry, when it comes to communication, I don't think there is one size fits all. Um, some people use email, some people use social media. And that's the thing we need to make sure that any communications are sent out in a lot of different ways, not yeah. relying upon just one. I mean, I worked for a company where if I hadn't replied to an email within 10 minutes of receiving it, I would have been on a discipline. Okay, I was allowed to put on an out of office if it was my coffee break or my lunch break, but most people don't respond quickly. They're really punishing in the Synod of Scotland, aren't they? <laughs> it wasn't Scotland, that's your point. <laughs> Yeah, my, my clerk's terrible. No, it wasn't It wasn't <laughs> anything to do with churches. But, you know, a lot of people don't respond. A lot of people don't use social media. So we need to make sure that we reach people in lots of different ways. And as a lay preacher, having been around lots of churches, please don't ask secretaries to print things because some of the printers are absolutely awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need good quality communications and something printed on a worn-out Think jet doesn't work. Uh, I don't have an answer, but we need a lot of different ways. Andy's so, got answers. He's the expert. It's not. It's not that long ago since I was in pastorate, so I do remember all, all those uh, all those issues. Um, so, but yes, uh, and I, th I think the thing we also need to remember is that the previous process was simply about trying to find people just from um, the circle of people that that the individuals who are at the meeting knew in the room. You know, we are now talking about, let's go out to the whole denomination in as many different ways as, as possible to try and um, encourage new people to come on board. Because obviously we, we touched earlier on about the fact that, um, you know, the smaller number of people who seem to be doing more and more roles. So if we can widen, um, widen the appeal, then hopefully we, um, we, we will kind of bring more resource into the URC. David Salisbury. We hear, heard very clearly what people were saying about how busy they are in their own local churches and not having capacity to serve uh, more widely than that. But I think we also got a sense that we need to try and turn that question on its head a little bit and uh, help people to understand that they, by serving the wider church, they are also serving their local church by doing so. We are we are all one church and a hierarchy of responsibilities. Uh, so if we are serving in synod roles or assembly roles, we're still serving the church. And you now we hear that it's very difficult to, to withdraw from roles in local churches when there are a few people to do those things. But then the same would apply to synod and assembly roles. You know, there's, we, we need people to sort of see how they can serve uh, the church, not just their local church, how important that might feel to them. And, and that working on a wider committee is very energising. I know our mission committee, um, you know, I, I generally find that people really enjoy the work and, and find they get so much out of it. So uh, it, it builds their own discipleship. Um, so the, the questions are coming thick and fast now. So um, I'll go to Daniel Harris next. 
Yeah, if it's just a throwaway comment, um, a lot of our churches are worn out. Um, I was hoping my personal view is that something like this process will lead to a lightening of loads. But we're talking about getting people onto more committees and more stuff, um, which I find is a bit ironic. I know it's, we've got to do this to solve a problem, but I think we need to find ways to lighten loads, not create more uh, workloads for people. And that's been very much the work on nominations because we are looking at um, slimming down the number of committees and there's always been a, already been an element of that. Um, these committees that we are recruiting for now are transitional ones. It's a two-year period, I think it is. Um, and hopefully the work that they will do that will then create the kind of resource that will lessen the load on the local church because it, it, it is all about trying to, as John mentioned earlier on, you know, everything in our ecclesiology comes from the local church. So the, the more that these committees are able to free up resources, the more we will be able to do a mission. Kate Yates? Yeah, thank you. Just building on those comments that have gone before and what you've just said, Philip, as well, I think it's also helping local churches through these communications to see the benefits to them, not immediately, but a little bit further down the line of how this can really help them. So for individual post holders in churches, it's like, what's in it for me? As for And for the local church, what's in it for me? And therefore that leads to the wider church. What's in it for us? Well, it's, you know, helping everything to work better, more efficiently, effectively, and mission at the bottom end of it, really. Um, so I think that was one thing. And the other thing was to do with communication. Also, I'm sure with the different modes of communication, thinking about how can we most effectively communicate with people who perhaps have different disabilities, perhaps who are hard of hearing or deaf or um, visually impaired or blind. How can, how can we get the appropriate communications to them when they might be really good members of these task groups. Thank you. Uh, uh, again, again, we're becoming more and more aware of uh, a catering for all needs. Um, uh, and I think the more we change that as, as an ethos of the, of the church to, uh, that it's not just simply in terms of the assembly committees, but actually right the way through the church as a whole. Catherine Price. Yeah, and this this will need to be our last question now because we um, we have a, a short piece before we end. And, but I do know that you'll all want to be finishing at nine o'clock to watch traces, I guess. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's not so much a um, a question. It's 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 about the whole how we get people to agree to be nominated, and it is about making the jobs feasible for them. They have to know exactly what it is they're being asked to do. And, and that there it is going to be possible both physically. So we need to know who's, 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 who wants to do these jobs and can we make it possible for them to attend, whether it's to do with their physical disabilities or whether it's to do with the jobs they're doing in their daily life. Uh, if, if meetings are always at a certain time and in a certain place, it will exclude people. But the other thing I was thinking was that it's also quite daunting to do something like this from a local church on your own. Um, could we actually think about maybe some churches being champions on certain tasks, especially if it's going to be about ideas for the future, about uh, what we are looking for, so that somebody coming onto a committee knows that they've got the support of their local church and they've got some people to go back to um, obviously not the things are confidential, but really make these roles ones that are doable for the people that we are going to be asking to do them. Thanks, Catherine. I think the point about um, people who take on these roles being supported by local churches is a really good one, and, and that would be one that um, would be good to, to develop. Your earlier point really sums up why we do safer recruitment. And I'm sure we've all been in the position where, you know, you've been tapped on the shoulder and say, oh, could you just take this role on? And there's really nothing to it. You know, we, we hardly ever meet and, you know, it won't take up very much of your time. And before you know it, you've got more than a full time job. Um, so that's why safer recruitment is really important. And there's, there's um, an interview process in that which properly describes actually what are the expectations? What are the needs? So I think we can now hopefully move on to the final part of our program. I'm going to pass to Adrian. Okay, thanks Philip. 
Um, Philip mentioned earlier Resolution 51A, which was passed by General Assembly last year, which asked the mission and discipleship departments to look at how mission, evangelism, and ministry, which would lead to the emergence of new URC communities of discipleship and worship, might be encouraged and resourced. And we've had a small group looking at this resolution and what the responses might look like. And there are several strands to that, but I did just want to take the opportunity to let you know that part of that response is some early planning about a major residential event early in 2025, which would draw together some key stakeholders from synods, training and development officers, mission enablers, children and youth development officers, evangelism enablers, along with representatives of the resource centers for learning, church-related community workers, special category ministry post holders, key church staff, some partners in mission who are ministering in the UK at the moment, and others who are serving throughout the church in pioneering roles. It surprises us that such key people have never been gathered together before and this resolution has provided both a springboard to enable that to happen and a clear focus for that gathering. So I suppose this is simply a watch this space type of announcement, but to let you know one strand of work that's been going on in response to that resolution. So I think we've got uh, 10 minutes or so left. So if there are any further uh, questions or comments that people would like to make. This is your opportunity to do so, but we will keep strictly to finishing at nine o'clock. Alison. Adrian, I was so busy. I was so busy listening to your long list of people who are going to be invited to that conference and wondering who wasn't going to be there that I didn't um uh I didn't really focus on what you said it was going to be concentrating on. Uh, but that was the first bit. So it's in response to resolution 51A from General Assembly last year. Okay, well could we have general uh, resolution 51A back on the screen then because my memory is not that photographic and retentive. Okay, I did read it out, but I'm sure. Yeah, did, I'm just. Uh, well, there, don't worry. So. Okay, forget it. My brain is going mushy. Don't worry. I will go and read it. The 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 the, the point of it, um, Alison, is about the formation of new, um, URC communities of of discipleship and worship. How do we do church planting, pioneering? How can we do that in a much more intentional, joined up, supported way as a denomination? That's the kind of top and bottom of it. I think we're just about to see it again on the. Um... Uh, on the on the screen. Okay, thank you. And then go back two slides. So. <laughs> Next one. Yeah, this one. Okay, so it's the it's the other side to uh, resourcing and supporting local churches that already exist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we need another another conference where everybody gets invited to look at that. Oh, no, sorry, that's when the task groups are finished. That's the General Assembly. Got it. Anyone else? You probably need to get rid of that screen so we can see if other hands are raised. Thank you. Oh, Vicky's iPhone 2 again. I'm so sorry. It's... Uh can't get it to say anything different um this is going to sound like a really stupid question all of these roles uh, i take it they're voluntary none of these are paid roles is that right yeah okay yes all right. essentially yeah yeah right thank you uh, fiona fiona bennett Thank you. I just wanted to kind of end with a note to say that um, I'm really excited about this, not because it's 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 um, 
this is not the vision and the attractive bit in the sense of we've done that, but this is a this is actually a path, um, a path to bring about the change that we've talked about. Um, and I do see it as hard work, and I do see it as you know it's hard work for a lot of people who are already uh, doing a lot of things. But we've talking we've been talking about change for a long time, and this is a roadmap to actually implement it. And I feel really really excited that we actually have steps to take that we can move forward in a way that is about discerning a future together. So I appreciate there's been a lot of hard work has gone in the background, which I'm grateful for. It's the beginning of something, um, but it is really exciting to actually see a way to move forward and to begin to embody some and make real some of the change that we have been talking about and have agreed at General Assembly. So thank you for that. Thank you, Fiona. Um, Elspeth. Um, just to say, I've been frantically touch typing on another screen the whole time this has been going on. And then I realised that it's being recorded. So are we going to be able to, to get copy? Uh, the answer is yes, you will be able to once once the um, once the video has been edited, it will be available on the website on the church. Library. Great. Thank and you. Also, OK, thank you. Jean. Oh, thank you. Um, I would just like to know, I, I, I would like to nominate some people for these task groups. And I'd like to know what is the, the email um, address to which we should send our nominations and to whom should we send them? Okay, the address is recruitment at urc.org.uk. Recruitment? Recruitment at urc.org.uk. And you'll find that on the website with all the information about the roles as well. But when we've just Thank put you. it in the chat. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Brian. Good evening, folks. Um, you might expect it from me, but simply to ask, um, are there plans to mobilise prayer for this whole process? The life of the church. Um, in a sense, only functions when it is surrounded by prayer. Um, I confess, Brian, we haven't got to the point where we've thought about, well, how do we make that happen around this process? Um, but that is something that absolutely is vital to the health of this process. Um, and something that, as it were, a huge amount of prayer and discernment went into um, helping take us to the place of General Assembly last year. That work was absolutely surrounded by prayer by so many people, not least those in, in the thick of it, uh, and their engagement with scripture as we journeyed together. Um, we need to think quite carefully about precisely how we surround this next part of the journey uh, in that way, um, when perhaps it's not quite as instinctive that when we're talking about, you know, finance and legal structures and stuff, and yet it is as vital that this is surrounded us by prayer as it is when we are thinking more about, you know, where is our foundational vision coming from for, for where we're going. So thank you for that and your perpetual calls to remember that, that we are nothing if we're not a community of prayer. Thank you. Uh, John, John Marsh, greetings. Oh, hello. Uh, just to say that I have regarded this whole enterprise as an act of prayer. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands of people who have burning things to say. Um, a reminder, um, reminders of your email address, Victoria, so that people have got it. Victoria.james at urc.org.uk. And the address for nominating and for applications, which is on the website, is recruitment at urc.org.uk. I think that brings us to the end of this evening, and I'd just like to conclude with a prayer, and we'll finish that prayer by saying the grace together, and I leave it entirely up to you whether you want to mute or, or unmute for that. So let's, let's pray. Living and loving God, we give you thanks for all of those who have given so much of their time and their energy and their vision to this process to date. 
We thank you for all the work that has gone into the development of terms of reference for the task groups and for the various people who will convene them. We thank you for this evening and for the ways in which we have been enabled to come together across the miles to listen and to share together. And now we pray for your blessing as we think of going to our beds in grant, we pray, rest this night that we may rise again to serve you anew tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may the grace, grace of, our of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the love and the, love of the, of the fellowship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit is all. In the Lord is all. And all. And all. Amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. A hundred and seventy odd at one point. Right, this process is going to be done.